A warm welcome to all of you uh, to another installment of our Gladys Stewart's Prudence Talk series. Thanks for joining us uh, rather than uh, the Lech and Tore colleagues uh, next door uh, by his choice uh, that you came uh, here. Um, I'm delighted uh, to present to you uh, tonight's speaker, uh, our dear friend and colleague uh, Andre Christan. Um, let me say a few words so that you are informed uh, who will speak uh, to us tonight. Um, Andre is a fellow at the University of Girona and a fellow at the Tarello Institute uh, for Legal Philosophy in Genoa. He holds a law degree from the University of Ljubljana and also no less than four master degrees from various uh, universities across Europe. Um, he uh, took his PhD at the University of Genoa and has been a visiting scholar in uh, Berkeley, University of California, and in Krakow. Most importantly, in 2015, he was awarded the European Award of Legal Theory, which is a very distinguished prize for the best legal philosophical PhD study uh, across the whole range of Europe in a two year period for its quite a distinguished um, award. He has just published um, a book uh, in Ma with Marcel Pons in Madrid on law and other animals, and he is also a co editor in chief of the Rebus, a journal for constitutional theory and philosophy of law. So, Andre, we are delighted that you. Uh, uh, present your talk tonight to us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm really glad to be here tonight. Uh, but since time is running, I will start with my talk. Uh, today we'll speak about the fallibility of final judicial decisions. That is, the possibility that a final decision is incorrect from the legal point of view. Now, my goal is to offer a redefinition of this concept, of fallible finality, as I will call it. As you will see, the redefinition is motivated by the fact that the standard understanding of this concept is far more problematic than is usually assumed. I will proceed in three steps. In the first part of the talk, I intend to show that the usual understanding which is based on the work of Herbert Hart, gives rise to a contradiction. I'll say later on what the contradiction is about. Um, then in the second part of the talk, we will briefly test three methods of resolving the problem, and I will conclude that none of them speaks in favor of distinguishing between the finality of judicial decisions on the one hand, and on the other hand, their infallibility. Finally, in the third part of the talk, we will re-examine Herbert Hart's motivations for embracing that distinction, and we will identify a misstep in his reasoning. I will thus conclude an open discussion with an alternative proposal that purports to respond to all of Hart's preoccupations without having to deal with the problematic consequences of his own now standard view. So, let us start with a non-legal paradox just to set the tone of what will follow later on. I've picked the Barber paradox reported by Russell about a century ago. Some of you might know it. The story goes like this. Uh, we have a village and there's a barber in this village. So suppose you define the barber as the one who shaves all those and those only who do not shave themselves. That is, the barber is the one who shaves all those who do not shave themselves and only those who do not shave themselves. Okay? Now, ask yourself, who shaves our barber? Does the barber shave himself or not? Think of it for a moment.
This question triggers a paradox. And here's why. If you respond that our barber shaves himself, then we shall conclude according to our definition that the barber does not shave himself. Why? Because the barber shaves only those who do not shave themselves, right? But if you respond that the barber does not shave himself, then we should conclude again by definition that our barber shaves himself because the barber shaves all those who do not shave themselves. This, of course, is paradoxical because however you respond, you just cannot get things right. Now, the lesson of this story, as reported by Russell, is that you cannot satisfactorily define the barber as one who shaves all those and only those who do not shave themselves. You cannot define the barber satisfactorily in this way because this definition gives rise to a contradiction. Contradictions do not exist in the real world with real barbers. So the definition must be wrong. It is wrong to assume that we can satisfactorily define the barber the way we did. Now, this was the non-legal paradox to set the tone. I wanted you to have it in mind during the talk. Because I believe that a somewhat similar deficiency must be attributed to Herbert Hart's characterization of final judicial decisions as fallible, that is, possibly incorrect from the legal point of view. My argument is short and simple. It has three elements. First, assume that there is a legally incorrect final decision, okay? We have in our hands a final decision and this is legally incorrect by whatever standard you have in mind. I don't mind. So we have a legally incorrect final decision. That's the first element. Now the second element. We are in Austria, in Slovenia, in whichever contemporary legal system. These systems have a rule to the effect that it is legally correct to comply with final judicial decisions, right? It's part of the rule of law. Now, if we have these two elements, that is, we have a legally incorrect final decision, and we are in a system with a rule to the effect that it is legally correct to comply with final judicial decisions, then in this case, we have a problem. From these two premises, we can derive the conclusion that is paradoxical, because in this case, it is legally correct to comply with the final judicial decision, which is legally incorrect. That means that it is legally correct to comply with that which is legally incorrect. Put in other words, it is legally correct to do that which is not legally correct. Now, this is the key sentence of the talk, so I better put it down. This means legally correct, okay? Just to simplify things. Now, how shall we respond to this apparently paradoxical conclusion? As I've mentioned earlier, we will briefly test three usual philosophical strategies to tackle any paradox. One of these strategies is to deny that the paradox actually exists. The other strategy is disambiguation. I'll say more about this later. And the third strategy is to drop one of the initial premises. Okay? Now, by analogy with the lesson drawn from the barber paradox mentioned earlier, one might suggest 
this last strategy, dropping one of the premises. In this case, we have two options. We could either drop the first premise or the second one. Remember, recall what were the two premises. We said, first, we have a legally invalid, illegally incorrect final decision. Second, we are in a system with a rule to the effect that it is legally correct to comply with final judicial decisions. Now, if we drop the first premise, then we have to conclude that there is no legally incorrect final decision. Right? Final judicial decisions cannot possibly be incorrect from the legal point of view if we drop the first premise for paradox. Now, on this account, Hart's characterization of final judicial decisions as fallible is unsatisfactory because it gives rise to a contradiction. This would make my argument too short, I think. <laughs> uh, I haven't even spent 10 minutes by my watch, and Hart was definitely not a stupid man. So let me see if I can do better, okay? Let us test some other strategies to resolve the paradox without invalidating Hart's view. Can we do that? What happens if we drop the second premise? That is, we are in a system with a rule to the effect that it is legally correct to comply with final judicial decisions. Let's call this the finality rule, okay? Now, if we drop this second premise, what we get is a theory that is inapplicable to the Austrian legal system. Why? Because here it is legally correct to comply with final judicial decisions. We get a theory that is inapplicable to Slovenian legal system, that is inapplicable to almost any legal system I can think of. Now, it is therefore uninteresting for the purposes of legal studies at the university to teach such a theory. It is uninteresting because it's not interesting for the practitioners. Now, accordingly, we shall put this option aside and turn to, turn to a somewhat more sophisticated ways in which such a paradox uh, could get resolved. In the remainder of this talk, I purport to show that these other options, I've mentioned disambiguation and denial of the existence of the paradox, are, however, no more beneficial for subscribers to Hart's notion of fallible finality than the first attempt to resolve the paradox. Now, one promising option consists, as I said, in disambiguating the phrase legally correct, which is the culprit of the reflexive fallacy in this key sentence. Okay? Let's call this P, the paradoxical sentence. Now, if we manage to disambiguate the phrase legally correct, then we can show that there's no paradox. That we are actually using one and the same phrase, legally correct, but with two different meanings, so there's no contradiction. Okay? What could these meanings be? In the aim of disambiguating the phrase legally correct, one might use the famous distinction between legal validity and applicability. Think of it. Uh, you all know that sometimes, especially in the cases of private international law, but also in other cases, judges in one legal system apply the rules that have no legal validity in that very legal system. Right? So it's perfectly possible to apply a legally invalid norm. Now, our case is a bit different, but let's see how the distinction would work. So one might also say in our case that it is legally correct to apply a final judicial decision even when this decision is legally invalid. In other words, one could say that it is sometimes, when we have a final judicial decision, legally correct to apply a legally invalid judicial decision. Okay? Apparently, this solves 
the problem or not. Why? Because to say that it is legally correct to apply an invalid decision is to say that it is legally valid to apply that which is legally invalid. So the paradox is still there, right? Now I'd have to disambiguate the phrase legally val legal validity, legally valid. Does this mean one and the same thing or two different things? If it means one and the same thing, the paradox is still there. So let's put this option aside. I'll mention a different one. An effective way to solve the paradox through disambiguation, I think, is to hold that it is legally correct, all things considered, to do that which is legally, correct, legally incorrect, all things considered but one rule. Let me explain. All things considered, that means all the rules of the legal system taken into account, including the finality rule, it is legally correct to apply that which, if we disregard the finality rule, would be legally incorrect because it violates some rules of the legal system. So, the proposal is this. We disambiguate the phrase legally correct into legally correct all things considered and legally correct all things considered but one rule, the finality rule, the rule according to which it is legally correct to comply with final judicial decisions. While this avoids the paradox, it also goes against Hart's stance that final judicial decisions are possibly incorrect from the legal point of view. For as it turns out, all things considered, they never are incorrect from the legal point of view. Right? So, that option doesn't help either. Another of the more sophisticated options worth exploring here, I think, is the most lawyerly solution to the problem. This has nothing to do with disambiguation, has nothing to do with dropping the premises. It has to do with denying that the paradox actually exists. This solution is based on the observation that, strictly speaking, what I called Hart's paradox, just to provoke a bit, um, is but a special type of inconsistency stemming from the legal system as this is construed. Now, it is perfectly consistent and not paradoxical to describe that inconsistency with this key sentence, right? When we talked about the barber paradox, we said, if a definition trying to describe the real world brings about a contradiction, the definition is simply wrong. Why? Because in the real world, contradictions do not exist. But this is not describing the real world. This is describing an ideal world, the world of Zolan. And in the world of law, we know that inconsistencies do exist, right? So describing the existence of such an inconsistency is perfectly consistent. So, where does the inconsistency come from? We could simply say that on the one hand, there is the rule that one ought to comply with final decisions. That is the finality rule as we named it earlier. Now, on the other hand, there is a rule violated by the final decision in question, whichever you wish. Call it rule X. So, we'll have the finality rule and we'll, re we'll have some rule X, whatever. The rule that is violated by the final decision, okay? If the final decision did not violate this second rule, then there would be no inconsistency between what follows for the case at hand from the finality rule and the rule X, respectively. This is why the inconsistency is of a special type in this case. Uh, it is contingent. The two rules only come into conflict when applied to a concrete case of a final decision violating 
the second rule. Now, this type of inconsistency is not so rare a phenomenon as to leave us perplexed in the way the Barber paradox does. Indeed, practicing lawyers are trained to face such inconsistency among others. And they solve most of them by means of the traditional meta principles of preference, which are based on the criteria of hierarchy, speciality, and posteriority. As you know, the principle of hierarchy says that the superior rules prevail over the inferior ones. The principle of specificity or speciality says that more specific rules prevail over more general ones. And the principle of posteriority says that subsequent rules prevail over the earlier ones. So let us see what these criteria say about our case. How would a practicing lawyer resolve the inconsistency? Given that the finality rule is part of the ideal of rule of law, and I can give you some jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights on this issue, um, I take it that the finality rule clearly belongs to the highest level in the hierarchy of laws and has the highest grade of generality in the sense that it applies to all cases. Hence, the application of the finality rule ought to be given preference over the application of this second rule that is violated by the final judicial decision in our case. Um, does this hold always or in general? It mostly holds, but not always. The opposite is true in the instance of the second rule being posterior to or less general than the finality rule while having the same rank in the hierarchy of laws. Okay, so on the face of it, this lawyerly analysis permits us to dismiss the paradox as unworthy of serious consideration and to precisely identify the circumstances in which it is safe to speak of fallible finality without being pedantic, over scrupulous. But is it really safe? Arguably, I say it is not. To see why not, we can think of three possible scenarios. With the rare circumstances just described. Okay? That is that the second rule is posterior to or less general than the finality rule, while they're both of the same rank in the hierarchy of laws. Um, in the first and the most unlikely scenario I will mention, the fact that the second rule ought to trump the finality rule is brought to the attention of a court that accepts the case for consideration. Okay. We will see in a moment what follows from, from this scenario. Now, in the second scenario, the courts reject considering the case. And in the third scenario, the issue is not even brought before a court. So these are the three scenarios. In the first scenario, the issue is resolved through constitutional interpretation operated by the courts in a new final decision, right? If the court took the case for consideration, then the court had to decide which of these two rules prevails. Given that both are from the highest level in the hierarchy of laws, they'll have to get to constitutional interpretation in order to solve the problem. Now, by that very fact that the courts decide the case in a new final decision, the previous decision, which violated the second rule loses the status of finality, right? If we re reopen the case, the decision that apparently closed the case is not 
the final decision anymore. Therefore, the previous decision does not count as an example of a legally incorrect final decision, even though it is erroneous or incorrect, all things considered. So we can leave this case aside. In the second and the third scenario, however, the solution confirmed in our final decision prevails regardless of what ought to be the case in virtue of the meta principles of preference mentioned earlier, hierarchy, specificity, posteriority. This means that in the second and the third scenario, the characterization of the final decision as legally incorrect has no legal consequence whatsoever. Now, to my knowledge, neither Herbert Hart nor his followers have offered a similar analysis to correct and therefore to narrow the usual scope of application of their notion of fallible finality. However, it appears that Hart would have accepted its conclusion. For Hart admitted explicitly in his book, The Concept of Law, that it may seem pedantic, he used this word, to distinguish in cases of res judicate between finality and infallibility of the court ruling, precisely because, I quote, the statement that the court was wrong has no consequences within the system, end of quote. Nonetheless, Hart decided to embrace the said distinction, pedantic distinction in his words, after his illuminating considerations of a fundamental disanalogy between legal adjudication on the one hand and what he called the game of scorer's discretion, on the other hand. Some of you might know what the game of scorer's discretion is, but I'll provide a summary of Hart's considerations and close this talk with a counter-argument that I think meets all of his preoccupations without falling into legally irrelevant pedantry. In Hart's fictitious game, the score is what the scorer says it is. Now, this is the scoring rule, okay? Think of football or hockey, if you want. If we would be in the scenario of the game of scorer's discretion, we would have goal when the arbiter, arbiter says it's a goal. Moreover, in the game of scorer's discretion, there is no sign of criticism seriously addressed to the scorer for misapplications of the scoring rule. In legal settings, by contrast, genuine criticisms frequently invoke misapplications of the law. So this is the main disanalogy between legal adjudication and the game of scorer's discretion. The existence of criticisms in the case of legal adjudication indicates a fundamental difference between the two social games. Now, Hart thought that in order to explain the difference, one has no other option but to assume that the result of legal adjudication, unlike that of scorer's discretion, is bound by rules established in advance. On this assumption, criticisms of judicial rulings obviously make sense. That is, as reactions to their purported, perceived violations of pre-existing rules. And what also makes sense is the distinction between the finality and infallibility of court rulings. A ruling may be final, but the judge is fallible, may err, and therefore a judge may make a legally incorrect final decision. This 
argument is widely shared in legal theory. But I believe it is based on a mistake. Hart's explanation, I think, is not the only option to illuminate the difference between legal adjudication and his fictitious game, scorer's discretion. Now, one may, wa my, one may wonder why we should even bother to explain the difference between legal adjudication on the one hand and some fictitious, inexistent game on the other hand. But I leave this objection aside for now. Suppose we have to explain the difference. I think there is another explanation that does not require one to embrace legally irrelevant pedantry. That is, distinguishing between finality of judicial decisions and their fallibility or infallibility. So I'm moving to the last talking point with the alternative proposal. Um, instead of assuming that the result of legal adjudication is bound by rules established in advance, unlike the scorer's discretion, this other proposal consists of pointing to the following pragmatic presupposition, which is constitutive of participation in legal adjudication, but absent from any game of scorer's discretion. Do you know what the presupposition is? Let's go to a non-legal example just for a moment. If I say the king of Austria is bold, then I'm saying that the king of Austria is bold, right? But there's something else. I'm presupposing that there is a king of Austria, right? So now you have an idea of what the presupposition is. In the case of legal adjudication, there is a different kind of presupposition. And the same does not exist in the game of scorer's discretion. Think of it. Whenever you participate in legal adjudication, you are bound by the presupposition according to which the interpretation is purportedly in agreement with the sources of law. That is, judicial decisions or proposals thereof are based on the sources of law and not on a mere fiat of discretion. To see the point, think of, think of an umpire who says when publicly stating his decision, that its content is in disagreement with every pre-existing authoritative pronouncement that is relevant to the case at hand. Such a disagreement would be conceptually impossible under the scoring rule, right? We said the scoring rule is that the score is what the scorer says it is. Now, for the scorer, there's no way to break this constitutive rule of scorer's discretion and by that very fact, step out of the game. But if the scorer says, this is my decision, and it goes against the constitutive rules of the game of scorer's discretion, is it still a valid decision in the context of this game or not? Yes, because the rule is, the score is whatever the scorer says it is, right? By contrast, Legal adjudication does not work in the same way. There is a possibility of stepping out of the game of legal adjudication. Were a judge in a court of law to make the same statement as the umpire I mentioned earlier, that is, were a judge in the court of law to state when he makes his decision public that its content is in disagreement with every pre-existing authoritative pronouncement constitutional clauses, statutory provisions, 
judicial precedent, etc., relevant for the case at hand, then we would say that he or she is not acting as a judge. His decision-making speech act, I believe, would be deemed pragmatically infelicitous. And one promising explanation of this infelicity is that the judge denied the set presupposition of agreeing with the lawgiver, with the sources of law. Now, because of such a step out, we would not be talking about a legally incorrect judicial decision. Rather, his decision would simply not count as a judicial one. We'd say he or she lost his mind, was not acting as a judge, although he or she was in the court. Now, based on these considerations, we can now explain the criticism of judicial rulings without assuming that these rulings are bound by rules established in advance, as Hart thought. Therefore, we can also explain the criticism of such final rulings without embracing the problematic notion of fallible finality. Criticisms of judicial rulings make sense as expressions of a perceived presupposition failure of those rulings. In other words, they purport to show, contrary to the presupposition in question, that a given ruling is in fact in disagreement with the relevant sources of law, either because the relevant sources are thought to be different from those considered by the judge, or because the ruling is deemed incompatible with those sources that were rightly considered relevant. Now, if the presupposition in question were semantic, rather than pragmatic, and I'll come to this point right away, then the presupposition failure would affect the correctness of the ruling. But in our case, it does not. Let me go back to the presupposition about the existence of the king of Austria. If I say the king of Austria is bald, am I saying something true? Is it true that the king of Austria is bald? So there are different theories. We can either take that I'm saying something that is neither true nor false, because there's no king of Austria, or we can say that what I'm saying is simply false. Either way, the problem is that, the problem is not in what I said, the problem is that the presupposition of what I'm saying is false. This is what happens with semantic presuppositions. But things are not the same with pragmatic presuppositions. Let me give you an example. Suppose Matthias and I talk about the weather in Ljubljana and what will the weather be or what the weather was this weekend. Now I tell him that it was sunny, better. I want to say that it was sunny, it actually was sunny, but Hector comes into the office and overheard our discussion about the weather last weekend, not knowing that we're talking about Ljubljana, he thinks we're talking about Graz and, was it sunny? I hope it wasn't. <laughs> Anyhow, suppose it wasn't sunny and that Hector says it was rainy. Now, is it true or false what Hector said? even though there was a presupposition failure. Why? Because the presupposition in our conversation is that we're talking about Ljubljana. What he's saying may be true or false. If it was rainy, it's true in Graz. If it was not, it's false. But the fact is that it is pragmatically infelicitous. His interaction in our conversation is pragmatically infelicitous because there's a presupposition failure. He thought we were speaking about Graz, but we were speaking about Ljubljana. Okay, so 
If the presupposition in question were semantic rather than pragmatic, in character, the presupposition failure would affect the correctness of the ruling. But since we have to do with the pragmatic presupposition, the fact that this is not accepted by some part of the audience does not affect the ruling's correctness as such. This explains why you can also criticize final judicial decisions, even if you think that they cannot possibly be incorrect from the legally relevant point of view. When you criticize them, you're basically saying that the relevant sources are not the ones that the judge took into consideration, or that his interpretation is not compatible with the sources that were rightly considered relevant. Now, we've arrived to the end of this talk. My objective was to demonstrate that Hart's characterization of final judicial decisions as possibly incorrect from the legal point of view gives rise to a contradiction. Then we've briefly tested three methods of solving the problem. First, by rejecting one of the initial assumptions. Second, by disambiguation of the expression legally correct. And at the end, through a resolution of the inconsistency between the rule that one ought to comply with final judicial decisions and the rule violated by the final decision in question. As it has turned out, none of the solutions treated here speaks in favor of distinguishing between the finality and infallibility of judicial decisions. That's why we have re-examined in the last part of my talk Hart's explicit motivations for embracing that distinction and we have identified a misstep in his reasoning. The misstep is that he thought his theory is the only way of explaining the difference between legal adjudication on the one hand and the fictitious game of scorer's discretion on the other. I hope I've shown an alternative proposal that responds to all of Hart's preoccupations, that is, let us distinguish between these two social practices even though one is fictitious and the other one is not, without paying the price as he did in legally irrelevant pedantry. So I thank you for your attention, and I hope you will attack me with critical comments in the discussion. Thank you. Andre, thanks very much for this inspiring and lucid and very clear talk. And I would like to invite all of you to ask questions, make comments, and challenge uh, the points Andre uh, has made. And so I still think that if you 
stated in the original term that it is legally correct to comply with rules that have been decided incorrectly is still not, not the same thing and therefore also not necessarily a contradiction. In the original paper, you wrote that, well, this could be again restated as, well, it is legally correct for citizens to comply with rules that the officials have decided. But then you rejected uh, in the paper on the terms and said, well, but the officials are bound by the rules as well. There my, my objection comes, and I hope it doesn't get too long. I think you're making a mistake, and it's similar to the mistake that Russell actually makes when he uses the barber as the example for his actually correct existing set theoretical um, uh, contradiction. Because in my view, there is no logical contradiction of a barber defined as someone who shaves everyone who doesn't shave himself and shaving himself. There's no logical contradiction. What Russell misses there is that being a barber, a professional barber, is a social role. It's a, so, it's, it's a social practice. It's not a property or a name for a person. So if it is Mr. Barber, then Russell would be correct. But if I am a barber by profession, I can easily shave myself without contradicting the rule that as a professional barber, I only shave people who don't shave themselves. Because if I shave myself, I'm doing this in private. I'm doing this not in exercise of the official role or of, of, of my professional role as a barber. And you can easily see how that this is a more plausible assumption. How do you think the barber shapes himself? Does he go to his own barber shop, sits down in the chair, says, Mr. Barber, please give me a shave, then shaves himself, then pays himself, um, uh, the child, That's the point. puts it back into his pocket. No, he's alone in his, in his private apartment, mm -hmm. shaving himself. So he can easily, as a private person, shave himself. He's still a professional barber, according to that. And I think, at least in your original, explaining the way of living in this situation, you make the same kind of mistake by saying, well, if it applies to officials as well, we cannot disagree the way according to the citizens because officials. But again, applying the rule or complying with the rule and making the rule are different social sort of practices. And this cannot be collapsed into each other because the same, it applies to the same persons. I can't easily make an incorrect decision and be bound by the decision afterwards. And I mean, since uh, the other talk is about soccer or uh, football, um, football referees face this all the time. They give a goal or deny a goal called incorrectly because of offside. Well, they learn that they made a mistake and they still have to stick to the rule, everyone has to stick to the rule, and there's no actual contradiction. So being bound by the rule that is still considered by everyone to be incorrect is no longer a contradiction. And that's what's wrong, so I'll do the second part that I want. Shall I reply? Thank you very much. Uh, I actually think there's no disagreement between us, so I'll explain why. Um, first, what you did with the barber paradox is basically you applied the strategy of disambiguation. You disambiguated the term barber into barber as a professional barber and barber as a, an individual citizen, right? And you said, when he shaves himself, he shaves himself as an individual and not as the barber because he's not charging himself for shaving himself. So that's one thing. I have no, nothing to, to, to challenge here. As for the Hartz paradox, I would also say I agree with you. I'm not saying there is a real paradox. What I'm saying is that when you dissolve the paradox by disambiguation, you cannot defend Hartz view anymore. So the challenge was this. Can we solve the paradox and still embrace Hart's theory according to which final judicial decisions can possibly be incorrect from the legal point of view? And I said, you can't do that. Because when you do that, you have to acknowledge that there are at least two different senses of legal correctness. There are more. But at least two different senses of legal correctness. And the one that permits you to say that the final judicial decision is legally incorrect is the one that has no legal consequences whatsoever. So the problem is a different one. 
The problem is, why would I develop a theory of law that is based on a notion of legal correctness that has no legal consequences whatsoever? If I want to develop a theory of law that is useful for legal practice, then I should follow legal consequences when I speak about legal correctness. So there's nothing wrong in speaking about legal correctness. It's just necessary to know that there are different senses of legal correctness, that some of them have legal consequences and others do not. I hope I've responded to your challenge. Now, we could continue the discussion on other points later on. Sorry? Okay, so okay. we can take your second point later, but first of all, I would like to invite other, other uh, commentators. Christian, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, what do you mean by legal consequences in this uh, context? Uh, legal com consequences uh, in the context of a judgment uh, that a legal decision is incorrect. I'll put it this way. I go to the court so that the court or the machinery of the state effectively protects my rights. Okay? So, if I have a final judicial decision that supposedly violates my rights, if it violates my rights, it's legally incorrect. Right? Then I should be able to go to the court and say, protect me. Otherwise, what kind of rights am I talking about? Legal rights? So, when I speak of legal consequences, I speak of those consequences of judicial decisions that effectively pro protect our rights. If the fact that I raise the claim of legal incorrectness of some judgment does not help me in protecting my rights, that means that my claim has no legal consequences whatsoever. No, but it might have uh, an effect uh, on other people, on other lawyers, uh, and on future <coughs> court decisions. Of course, that's why I said at the end that it's very important to explain why it, is, it makes sense to criticize judicial decisions, even final ones. But, but then you say, even if you think that they cannot possibly be incorrect from a legally relevant point of view. Yes. And this is the point where you lose me. <laughs> the legally relevant point of view for the concrete case at hand? For, for the case at hand. Um, yes, so, but, but even for the case at hand. No, the way out would be to say, we need to distinguish, uh, let's put it this way, if you want, uh, erga omnes effects and inter partes effects, okay? When you speak of other judges, other cases, you speak about erga omnes effects. So maybe if I criticize a judge saying that his argumentation is unsustainable because it fails the presupposition, then other judges will not make the same presupposition failure again. So it had some effects on other cases, but not in this concrete case. And whenever we do, we make criticisms in a classroom, in a law journal, or on TV, what we're trying to do, we're trying to do this. We're, we're speaking about hypothetical future cases in which we want a different decision. I hope I've responded to your challenge. When I criticize uh, a legal decision that affects me, uh, uh, why can I not uh, assume uh, that this legal decision, even if I cannot change it, especially yeah. afterwards, after the decision uh, has been made, um, why can why can I say uh, that uh, the decision is incorrect uh, from a legally relevant point of view? Uh, okay, I, I guess uh, everything depends on relevance uh, in this uh, sense. 
Yes. Uh, okay, it's not, not, not relevant uh, to me and my case because my case uh, has been uh, decided. Uh, but it's still really relevant to my mindset about the case. Okay, and then I would say you are right. You're perfectly right, you can say that. But then we need to distinguish different senses of legal relevance. And say, even if we teach these kind of theories, these kind of concepts of law that are based on your sense of legal relevance, we still need the other theory that helps the practitioners work in practice. Because it helps them explain and predict how legal discourse actually works. Actually, I have uh, a preference for the uh, uh, loyalty uh, solution uh, that we presented. Uh, uh, but I would place it uh, in a more or less non positivistic uh, context. Uh, so uh, I can evaluate some of the problems uh, yeah. that you, you mentioned. Uh, this is an important point that I can step in there. And I was just wondering, just uh, as a matter of clarification, um, I was just wondering whether your argument um, presupposes a positivist view on validity of the law in the sense that uh, the validity of the law does not depend in any sense on its, uh, let's say, correctness from a moral point of view or justice or whatever. So really a, a, a positivist uh, view. Or whether your argument is uh, independent of the positivist, non-positivist uh, distinction? Um, it is completely dependent on the distinction. I would go even further and I would say that it presupposes a legal realist view. Okay. So that, that, that helps a lot, uh, I think, in explaining uh, why, why you uh, um, come so, up with this argument. So maybe, maybe I can say just a bit more about why did I come up with this argument. Um, I'm working in uh, an environment of legal theorists. And whenever I go out of this context, people say, it's uninteresting whatever you have to say or whatever legal realists have to say. Why? Because Hart killed legal realism so many years ago. So there are people working in the legal realist environment and the rest don't read them. And these legal realists don't read the rest. Why? Because the rest think that legal realism is dead and legal realists never actually responded to Hart's challenge. At least, to my knowledge, legal realists never took seriously the challenge of distinguishing between the fictitious game of scorer's discretion on the one hand and legal adjudication on the other hand. So what I was trying to do here is put legal realism back on the table. I don't want to say it's the best option. I'm just saying it's still the option on the table. So if you prefer natural law or something else, then of course we can discuss. But then we should see which of the theories explains best everything that we want to explain. Yeah, because I think for it just to, to add that for a legal non the way out of the paradox would be extremely easy simply to distinguish, to distinguish two, two, two um, conceptions of correctness, one including uh, moral correctness and the other only relating to real, realist, uh, positivist uh, uh, stances. But of course, if you stay within a legal positivist or even legal realist um, uh, paradigm, then this way out uh, is not at your disposal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for this time. Okay. Sorry. Although the strategy is the same for legal realists or positivists, as I said, even they should be able to accept that there are different senses of legal correctness. And then they should say, okay, which one is important for our purposes? Mm -hmm. So let me know what is your theory about, and then I'll tell you whether it's effective or not. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. I'd like to make a comment, but I'm not a legal philosopher, so I won't challenge you with your paradox. But um, probably legal philosopher to, to be honest. Um, but I think um, what I learned today is that um, 
this problem that you showed is very interesting and it's a um, problem of logic. And um, I'd like to respond in a way to argue that law in Austria as a system accepts probability of final decisions. I think the concept of paradox we show this shows that it's very um, it's that there's a problem with the logical structure and that sometimes you don't have a way out. Other, other way to go, you might have a problem. And the problem is that you don't accept probability yeah, in a very short sense. Austrian law does accept for the ability of humans, and there's a very humane aspect of the law. For example, civil procedure law, since the end of the 19th century, accepts that we have a decision that might be materially wrong. For example, I'm a judge in court, and somebody, a party claims that the other party owes him 500 euros or something. And since the other party is my friend, and I know as a fact that this has not been the case, I know it's not true if I, um, if I uh, have a judgment in front of the party, uh, in favor of the party, sending from the right? If I say you have to pay 500 euros. But from a procedural uh, point of view, I have to make a judgment. I don't have a way out. So I make a wrong judgment, which is binding for all uh, parties. The party does not apply a remedy against it. So the procedural law accepts fallibility accepts false decisions. And we have it in a very high, uh, in another hierarchy as well. Uh, in constitutional law, we accept uh, mistakes that the lawmaker has made. We call it since the 20s, we have a little, um, what, do you call it? what do you call it in English? We have a good, yeah. Can you help me out? To be honest, the error in what? The lawmaker accepts calculated uh, mistakes. Calculated mistakes. The Constitution uh -huh. says that calculated mistakes in lawmaking are okay. The rule is valid even though it is incorrect in a material point, from a material point of view, as long as the formal rules of creating the rules are um, have been um, uh, thank you, I've been observed. And this is, uh, and this rule is correct and valid as long as the constitutional court says it is invalid. And if this does not happen, this materially incorrect rule will be valid as long as ever, and everybody who is subject to the law has to compel with it. So we accept in a way in Austrian law culture and in our tradition that rules may be uh, followed and that the lawmaker is forward. And it's not only with the lawmaker that we accept it, this concept, also with the decisions of highest courts, because we don't have state liability for these decisions. If the high, uh, the high Supreme Court of Austria, in civil matters, for example, makes a decision where everybody else says, my God, there's are terrible decisions, and all the scholar right, this is a really bad decision, and they don't go with uh, with what they said the last 20 years. It is still a valid decision, you are still bound by it, and you cannot even claim compensation for this, um, for this judgment, which was made obviously wrong. So, what I want to make as a point, I'm uh, sorry to take yeah. this along, um, Austrian law accepts, in a way, uh, for the ability of final decisions, and we go with that. And it's a very humane concept that we believe that human people make errors, even high, high judges make these mistakes. May I reply? No, I have two, three replies. First, again, I don't see any conflict between what I was saying and what you were trying to point out. That's why I was talking about legally correct, all things considered, and legally correct, all things considered, minus the finality rule. Yeah, of course. If you say, legally correct, all things considered, minus this rule, we can speak about many failures in the legal system. That's one answer. The other is, um, when you speak about the fallibility, human fallibility of judges, I'd say that there we have to make a distinction between a judge as an individual and a judge as a public official. Of course, if I say that a judge as an individual may err, this does not automatically mean that his decisions, as legal decisions, institutional decisions, are fallible. 
And when I say that they are not fallible, I'm not saying that they're right, they are correct. I'm saying that there's no sense in predicating correctness or incorrectness to those decisions because in a way, but that should be for a different talk, final decisions make law for the case at hand. I think you're really interesting. I, I, I totally agree with that. I didn't want to contradict your point of view. I just wanted to add something from uh, back to the point of view. Oh, so that's why I saw it. It was compatible so with you. Uh, but I think that it's really interesting what makes a decision an incorrect decision. I, I cannot answer that. But it's a very interesting point of view. Is it if there's a decision which is um, against all methodological, methodological principles? Is it if the decision, um, if there are better arguments for another decision? Or is it if somebody has made a decision who has not officially the power to make a decision? But I don't want to answer. Uh, don't want I can answer, answer from you because I think this is a big problem. I just want to point out that this is a very tricky thing. And yeah, this all depends on the concept of what you have. And there's another distinction to be made. Uh, whether the question is about the incorrectness or correctness of final decisions or any decision whatsoever. But we can leave that aside for, for later. Did you finish your answer to Thomas? I think I have. OK, great. Right. Then Thanks. that's another question over there. I would like to know how is it that you think that uh, Thomas and Yara standpoint of view would help to solve all this problem or to throw more light over it? Because uh, the examples that he gave, for, for instance, of the scalability, I think the Kelsenian would say that these are not uh, fail or mistakes, they are law itself. Do you, given the constitutive nature of a legal decision, you can say from a, a legal scientist's position that that's not law, but to that case, it is law. That's a great question. I actually think that we could do the same exercise with Kelsen and we would see that there's a contradiction in Kelsen's theory as well. I mean, something similar to Hart's paradox in Kelsen's theory as well. But I'd like to point, I'd like to take this opportunity to ask you something. You said unconstitutional. I, I, yeah, I have a problem with, with uh, English translations of Kelsen because I think they are all wrong <laughs> because they use the word unconstitutional. So how do you say unconstitutional in German? Verfassungswidrig. So it's not, it's not Unrecht. It's very different. So it's not like illegal, unconstitutional. Legal, illegal is not the same as constitutional, unconstitutional in, Kelsen, in Kelsen's framework, right? It's something is... Unconstitutional means against the Constitution. Yeah, in English, but how do you say it in German? Verfassungswidrig, against. Yeah, the rules of the Constitution. Let me look for something. I mean, the decisive question is whether or not uh, unconstitutionality amounts to invalidity, does it not? Or uh, how, what, what consequence on the validity of the norm or of, yeah. on the obligation to obey the law unconstitutionality really has. And then we have this issue of competence, who is competent to decide upon annulling uh, like a legal norm and so on. I think that's the point. 
that. So, and this problem, I think that it makes it so that the requirement of the Supreme Court, but when it comes to the Supreme Court, you can't make a Supreme Court to judge Supreme Court decisions. So it's a final point of the, of the legal system, I think, that once you get there, you can't really say it's not law anymore or that's legally wrong. Sure, but even the Constitutional Court can err, can't it? It's, it in fact, it frequently does. Depends on your concept. Yeah, it depends on your concept. In which sense? Sorry? In which sense can it err? There are Supreme Courts that... It can apply the Constitution wrong. And there are Supreme Courts or Constitutional Courts that say it's explicitly our previous decision was wrong when it was decided, for example. So, uh, let, let me... We have two other uh, Supreme Courts uh, in Austria. And they may say, uh, yeah. okay, uh, That's whatever a bigger the problem. Constitutional yeah. Court says, uh, I don't care about it, uh, yeah. because uh, that's sure. absurd, or, not, or at least wrong. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me go back, since you were all against me on one point, where you're the experts and I'm not the expert, German language. Is it true that legal and illegal are contradiction? These two terms are in contradiction, right? Legal is opposed to illegal. A certain act could not be both at the same time. Okay, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, if I understood you correctly, you say that constitutional and inconstitutional works the same way, yeah. even for Kelsen. Now, I, here I have a citation from Kelsen, translated by Stanley and Bonnie, Paulson. And it goes like this. What is termed inconstitutionality of a statute, that's important, is in no way a logical contradiction between the content of the statute and the content of the Constitution. Was man Verfassungswidrigkeit des Gesetzes nennt, ist somit keineswegs ein logischer Widerspruch, in dem der Inhalt eines Gesetzes zum Inhalt der Verfassung steht. Sondern was? Ah, uh, so that's the problem. I don't have it here. Okay, I'll have to look for it. Yeah. Maybe later on I can yeah, I can look for it. Yeah, okay. Do. So But mind you, that's two different interpretations of what constitutional adjudication is. One interpretation is it is constitutional, but uh, another alternative interpretation would be that a constitutional court, by delivering a judgment, does not actually constitute uh, whether or not the statute is constitutional or unconstitutional, but rather it only uh, uh, sort of uh, declares what is uh, constituted uh, irrespective or, or <coughs> independent of that very decision. It, it would depend, I think, wouldn't it? Maybe I found the part of the, another part of the Kelsen's text that responds to your question. A non-constitutional statute is a valid statute that either in the manner of its creation or in its content fails to conform to the provisions of the prevailing constitution. Ein Verfassungswidrigkeitsgesetz ist ein gültiges Gesetz, das entweder durch die Art seines zustande, zu, äh, zustande, zustande kommens oder durch seinen Inhalt den Bestimmungen der geltenden Verfassung widerspricht. I'm sorry for my German, but... Yeah. So, you're going to, on, on the basis of that, you're... So, I, well, anyhow, depends on what the right interpretation is, because I, I, I don't read Kelsen's text directly in German, so I can only compare to them. But depending on what his mind was, uh, I could give you one or the other answer. I could say that either Kelsen evades the problem or has the same problem as Hart. 
I'm sorry I can't say more about that now. I'm not uh, specialized in calcium. Thomas, one more intervention. Maybe we should not stick so much to calcium standard axial. Because in a way, calcium standard axial is what goes before the Austrian constitution where he uh, puts all his thoughts into law making. Maybe we should switch to the Austrian constitution itself where those ideas became manifested. And if you take a look at Article 140 of the Austrian Constitution, it explicitly says that the Austrian Constitution of Courts decides on the Verfassungs from from Gesetzen, which means it goes on the, it, it focuses on the remedy point of view. You know, it takes a look: is there a problem? And if there's a problem of the law, it can um, destroy in a way this uh, this uh, regulation if it is a Verfassungswidrig. So it's the term Kelsen used a few years later in the Austrian constitutional system. So we, in a way, what I'm trying to say is that obviously when you look at the Austrian constitution, um, you, you obviously thought that unconstitutional harassment is in a way illegal. And because it is illegal, it has to be uh, abolished. So you think he changed his mind completely because he clearly says if I understand what you say. Translation correct. Sorry, sorry to put it that very simple way, but um, maybe I'll show you. Maybe we can talk about it later, and I'll give you uh, a trans um, translation of the Austrian Constitution, where I can point that point out that view. Because I think it has changed. Maybe it, it's not only Kelsen who. Um, who was the founder of the Austrian Constitution, and there were other people involved too, but he was definitely one of the main guys behind it. But I think we should maybe take a look at what happened later to, to interpret correctly his words. It's I'll do that. Thank you. you. Okay. So, thanks very much, everybody. I think in the view of the time, uh, that, uh, this concludes our business tonight. Uh, I would like to thank you all for, for being with us and, and engaging in discussion and, uh, and listening and, and so on and um, uh, giving us your preference in, uh, before, uh, uh, in comparison to uh, and forward. And uh, I would like to announce that the next um, GJ talk will be on uh, Tuesday, the 12th of December, so quite soon, Chiara Valentini. Uh, from uh, Barcelona to join us again. And I think we should not um, uh, separate and depart without thanking our dear speaker tonight. Anyway, thanks a lot for being with us. Thank you very much.